there's a few things that I always do when I get a new iPad. And I was about to go through them, but thought this time I'd do it on camera. And let's start with the home page because after I delete every app I don't want and install my favorite ones, I then remove them from the screen. And this is different from deleting them as the apps are still in your iPad. You can find them via the spotlight search, the dock, or, and this is where the iPad really shines, you can turn them into widgets. So starting from the top, I have three widgets which recommend me apps and shortcuts based on where I am, what I'm doing, and what time of the day it is. So what you see here is always changing, and you can get these in the widgets page under Siri suggestions. And these get progressively more accurate the more you use your device. On my old iPad, it even picks up on my exact location inside my house, so it knows exactly what to suggest at any given time. Then I have a weather widget, another for perplexity, which for me has actually replaced Google in a lot of ways, and what's cool is if I press this icon, it takes me straight straight to voice mode. Then I have a battery widget for any Bluetooth device connected to my iPad and a Duolingo widget. And then down here I have one for my task manager app which is Todoist, a calendar widget from BusyCal and the widget for the mail app that shows every email that is flagged so that I know to act on it. More on this later. But there's a few apps that I access often that either don't have widgets or they're kind of useless and those go on the dock. And by the way, the apps you put on the dock will not show up in these widgets here. And speaking of the dock, to the right of this line, we have the recent apps and the app library. And I don't use either of these, so I get rid of both by going to settings, home screen and app library, and I toggle both of them off. Much better. And because I want to have only one screen, I also toggle this option here so that every new app I download skips the home screen and goes straight to the app library. So now let's fix the display settings. First, I turn on night shift, which makes the display warmer as it gets later in the day and I set the color temperature all the way to the right. But if you're like me and don't think that this gets warm enough, I have a way to make it even warmer. More on that in a second. I also set auto lock for 15 minutes and the other thing I change is to remove the auto brightness feature, which is actually buried under accessibility settings, display and text size, and it's all the way at the bottom. And if we go into color settings, this is how you can create the super night mode that I was talking about just now. All you gotta do is turn it on and then move the hue bar all the way to the right. And we can then add it to the control center by swiping down on the top right, long press anywhere, then tap add control, search for color controls, and then add it to the control center. And now we can easily toggle it on and off. And speaking of the control center, when it was redesigned, it took a long time for third party apps to work on it. But now they do, so take a look through them, because I'm sure you'll find stuff that wasn't there before. I set mine up by first removing the ones I don't use, which is stage manager, the one to add a note because I have a better way for it, more on that later, and the silent mode. I'm always on it, so there's no reason for me to have it here. I then add low battery mode, screen recording, add task to Todoist, add event to BusyCal, and a few of my favorite HomeKit scenes. And by the way, I have this exact same control center on the iPhone with the exception of some controls for my car. Okay, so there's a few things I change under multitasking and gestures. The first is to disable the shake to undo feature. I have no idea who would benefit from this and I'm not about to shake an 11 inch tablet every time I want to undo something. And when you're using the Apple Pencil, every time you swipe to the center from the bottom left corner of your screen, it takes a screenshot. And if you do it from the bottom right, it opens up a quick note. And if you wanna be able to do this with your finger like me, then we need to toggle on the option to swipe finger from corner. I leave the rest as is, but you can swap them around or turn one of them off. And speaking of the Apple Pencil, there's a couple changes I make to it. The first is that I toggle on the option to only draw with the Apple Pencil. And because I can't draw to save my life, this is really only for when I'm taking handwritten notes so that I don't accidentally touch the screen and start having little dots show up everywhere. But what actually opens up a ton of possibilities is this function here called Squeeze. And by default, it lets you map it to a bunch of drawing related features. But what's really cool is that it can also be mapped to a shortcut, kind of like the action button on an iPhone. So if we make a simple shortcut that takes us to the home screen and map it to the Apple Pencil, we can now go to the home screen by squeezing it. This opens up a world of possibilities because you can make a very long shortcut that does different things based on different parameters, like what focus mode you're on or even what app you're using. I just got this in the mail a couple days ago, so I haven't had the time to play around with it. But I might make something like I did with the action button and share it on my free newsletter. If you want to sign up, the link is in the description. Another thing that I put on every iPad 
Notepad is a screen protector from Paperlike who I'm partnering with for today's video. And that's because it does two things extremely well. The first is that it's a great screen protector that both reduces glare and feels great to the touch, all while keeping the amazing quality of your iPad screen. And second is that it provides you with a paper feel texture that makes it feel like you're drawing or writing on actual paper. Not only that, but it also sounds like paper, which makes the process of writing on it super satisfying. It also fits every single iPad and installing it is super easy. If you use an Apple Pencil, then this is a must. Grab yours using my link in the description and thank you Paperlike for sponsoring this video. Okay, so I don't know about you, but the iPad is my least upgraded Apple device. My last one was bought six years ago in 2019, so I definitely want to do all that I can to prolong its lifespan and the battery life. And the first thing I do is to reduce background app refreshes. Because by default, every single app is turned on and chances are you don't need your iPad to constantly refresh these apps. So I go through them and disable nearly all of them. And I wouldn't be surprised if this also increases performance. And by default, your iPad is constantly listening for you to say the S word, which also eats up your battery. I'm still waiting for the day when this is remotely useful, so for now, I continue to turn it off. And if you have one of the newer models, you can set your iPad to stop charging once it reaches 80%. This is something we've had on the iPhone for a while, and I can't believe it only just arrived on the iPad. Another thing that probably saves battery, but it's not the reason I do it, is to turn most, if not all of the notifications off. I already have them coming in on my iPhone and my watch, so I really don't need another device for it. Okay, so as you know, apps that want to track you need to get your permission to do so. I mean, I don't know who sees that pop-up and presses yes, but you can actually stop apps from even asking you altogether. You can do this under privacy and security, tracking, and then toggle off allow apps to request the track. And speaking of new apps, you know when you start using a new one and all of a sudden you get that annoying pop-up asking you to review it? We can turn this off by scrolling down to apps, app store, and toggling off in-app ratings and reviews. Also, not every service or website has an iPad app, but as long as there's a website for it, we can kind of turn it into an app. For instance, if I go on the Google Flights website, which doesn't have a native app, I can press the share button and then add the home screen. And this doesn't turn it into an app, but it does act as a shortcut to it and will also let me launch it from the spotlight. And this also works great with those apps like Instagram that don't have a native app, but instead open the iPhone version of it. It's not as responsive as a native app, but it's as close as you'll get. Okay, so now I'm gonna rapid fire through a couple of settings before going into some app specific changes. All right, so you know how when you long press anything on the iPad or even on the iPhone, like an app or a link, it takes a little while to register and show you the contextual menu? Well, we can actually make this a lot faster by going to accessibility settings, touch, haptic touch, and then changing the touch duration to fast. Much better. Also, if you speak more than one language, you no longer need to swap dictionaries on the keyboard. Because as of iPadOS and iOS 18, you can now combine multiple languages into the same keyboard. Just head over to general, keyboard, then keyboards, add new keyboard, now choose your other language, which for me is Portuguese, and it's then gonna give you an option to combine that with your existing keyboard. And the last system setting I change is under storage, and that's to enable the iPad to offload unused apps when I'm low on storage. Okay, so now let's go into some app-specific changes. And the first one is the mail app, because by default, if you swipe left, it marks the email as read or unread, depending on if you've already opened it or not. I don't really use this, so instead, Instead, I go into settings, apps, mail, and then under swipe options, I change this to flag. And that's how I get my important emails always showing in the home screen under my mail widget. And then under signature, I remove sent from my iPad. And by the way, you can change your default mail app here if you don't want to use a stock one. Okay, so next I go into Safari settings and I change my default browser to Arc. But if you're set on using Safari, there's two changes you can make that make it much better. The first is to scroll down to tabs and choose compact tab bar. Because the default option takes quite a lot of space, especially if you don't have the 13 inch model. And this gives you back that extra bit of real estate. And you know how if you don't close a tab on Safari, it kind of just stays there forever? We can fix that by going to close tabs and then choosing something other than manually. 
For me, after one week is plenty. And by default, if you tap the screen when it's locked with your Apple Pencil, it's gonna open up a new note. I can't believe that this is on by default, but luckily we can turn this off under note settings, then scroll all the way to the bottom and toggle off access notes from lock screen. And if you're wondering why go through all of this as opposed to just transferring your settings from a previous iPad, that's because old iPads pile on a bunch of crap like cached files and forgotten apps that you probably don't even use anymore. Plus my old iPad was a 2019 model which didn't even have an M chip inside, so starting fresh was really a no-brainer here. And by the way, this video was part of a series where I did the same thing for both the Apple Watch and the Mac. So if you like this video, you're probably gonna like those as well and you can find them right here. I'll see you there.